Number two. <laughs> or at the very least, the cuckoo in the nest. I'm not a, a sort of academic super brain historical expert like the uh, other members of the panel. I'm uh, a filmmaker, writer and director. I turn my attention to subjects, become sort of moderately knowledgeable about them for a short period of time and move on. And about 12 years ago I received a letter uh, after I made a film about the British peacekeeping effort in Bosnia from an old British soldier who would served during the, um, the peacekeeping mandate in what was then called Palestine. Um, and he was talking about the film we made about Bosnia and he said as a sort of afterthought He'd served in Palestine, but of course we'd never make a film about that because nobody's interested. Well, that seemed like a kind of um, challenge, really. So I started to research it, and I, you know, I'm a moderately well-educated person. I was shocked by what I'd discovered. You know, I, I think the attitude of most, I mean, people in this room are probably much more expert than that, but the majority of British people they look at the situation in Israel-Palestine and they think it's tragic, it's intractable, and it's nothing to do with me. And what my research suggested to me was that it was rather a lot to do with us. <laughs> <laughs> because when General Anbi marched, <laughs> marched into Palestine and took it over from the Ottomans in, what was it, 1917. And uh, the, the League of Nations gave Britain, you know, did, did what we, we love doing, carving up other people's <coughs> countries, uh, gave Britain control of Palestine, Transjordan, which we ruled until 1948. We, we were the colonial power there. And didn't we do a great job? <laughs> I mean, it must be admitted that it was one of a number of really great jobs we were doing around the world <laughs> in decolonisation and around that time. And, and in fairness to the British government, I'm just about managed to get these words out of my clenched lips. Uh, you know, we'd just come through the First World War, the country was completely bankrupt. I mean, think about this. Britain received an $8 billion loan from the United States. $8 billion in 1945. Imagine what that's worth today. The country was completely bankrupt. And we had the small matter of decolonizing India <laughs> on our mind. So, you know, Palestine, it was embarrassing. We just won the Second World War and we were being shat on by a group, a small ragtag group of insurgents. <coughs> it was humiliating. We had, we had 100,000 men, or it mostly was men, under arms. And we were confined behind Danart wire, let's get out. Let's get out with the minimum <coughs> cost above all, the minimum difficulty, and let the consequences go hang. And unfortunately, the world has been dealing with the destabilizing consequences for the last 50 or 60 years, you know, and, and, and we see it all around us today. Um, so, spool forward, I, I went and made a film, it was, it was eight hours long, brevity is not my strong suit, <laughs> uh, called The Promise, it was about a guy who served during the peacekeeping effort in between 1945 and 48, and it was about his granddaughter who went back there many years later in the present time frame to try and find out what had happened to him. It was a bizarre and complicated film to make because we shot every frame in, in Israel. And I went in with the, you know, the naivety of the idiot treading where, the fool treading where angels will fear to tread. Uh, for example, I asked, I had this idea that, you know, Palestinians should play Palestinians in the film and, and Jews should play Jews. I've made films in other parts of the world, it didn't seem to be that radical an idea. <laughs> um, 
you know, and there were some quite tough scenes. You, you know, you had Jewish settlers in Hebron screaming at, um, at, at, at Palestinians who, who were trying to live their lives there, and some of the scenes were, were very aggressive and very difficult. Of course, what my stupid, naive brain hadn't quite realized was that the you know, the, the Jewish people who were playing the soldiers were, were all often reservists in the Israeli Defense Forces. And, and the, the, the Palestinians, you know, had had a lifetime of experience of that kind of repressive behavior. So trying to get them to dramatize the, you know, was a complicated matter. And um, it was interesting, and just one particularly sort of unpleasant scene that we dramatized, the, the two actors the, the Jewish actress and the Palestinian actress wanted to be photographed together arm in arm at the end. I thought, well, that's very nice. You know, we'll get the set photographer along to take the picture. I didn't really, and then they both separately came to me afterwards and said, Do you, and then these were people who had been acting for, for 20 years or more, but they had never, in that 20 year career, both on stage or on screen, acted with a member of the opposite community before ever. And that, within my sort of the small little world that I inhabit, hit me like a brick. Such is the level of alienation that, you know, and the, and the Jewish actress said to me, when we do this kind of thing, we have Jews playing Palestinians. So spool forward to the film being transmitted, and it was shown pretty much everywhere in the world. Nothing prepared me for the level of vitriol that was going to drop on me from the Zionist lobby. Nothing. In, in all the sort of 30 years of making tough programs, they, they were the nursery slopes compared to the <laughs> concerted personal, vicious stuff that came my way. And, and, I, and I'm going to stop because you know, I think it's much more interesting to hear what you guys have to say, but I was left with one really striking puzzlement. <coughs> and again, to you a rather educated audience, this will seem blindingly obvious. If I choose to criticize my I'm a Brit. If I choose to criticize my country, um, and I often do, nobody says, well, very few people say I'm not patriotic. Certainly nobody calls me a racist. They accept that it's a legitimate thing in a free society to criticize the political and dipl diplomatic behavior, the domestic and foreign policies of a sovereign state doesn't mean that you're not a loyal member of that state, it just means that you, have, you disagree with its political behavior. But if you're Jewish, as I am, and you criticize the domestic and or foreign policy of the sovereign state of Israel, you are immediately called an anti-Semite. Very clever, isn't it? Very clever. You, you can't you can't criticize the behavior of a sovereign state, a member of the United Nations, without being called a racist. And of course, because of the Holocaust, it, you, you know, it, it's an immensely sensitive accusation to level at someone that you're an anti-Semite. And, and to me, that's the most troubling thing, you know, as I say, as a, as a cuckoo in this academic nest, about the whole discourse, that the Western world is ultimately hobbled in its ability <coughs> to criticize, but irrespective of, of more geopolitical considerations, we are still, after all these years, restricted in our ability to criticize the, the, you know, the straightforward behavior of an elected government in the state of Israel for fear <coughs> that we will be accused of being anti-Semites. And that's what I've spent two years plus wrestling with. <laughs>